how do you become a more conscious, respectful, and peaceful parent? It doesn't just happen. You need a good set of tools. Sometimes it's just like a toolbox. Sometimes you need a Phillips head, sometimes a flat head. Um, it all just depends on the situation in your own parenting, just like it depends on the kind of project that you're working on. Um, one singular approach is not going to solve all problems. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to discuss the tools we actually use in our own parenting. Mm -hmm. And we're going to share a day in the life of a Montessori parent which That's is something right. that uh, I think that we both really enjoy doing is kind of highlighting our members. Um, so welcome to Montessori 101, which is a series all about the magic of Montessori. We actually believe that every child deserves a Montessori education and every child can get one. You can give your child a Montessori education. I'm Aubrey Hargis. And I'm David Hargis. Uh, you can find us at childofredwoods.com. It's our home on the web. And like Aubrey said, today we have a member spotlight, which is really exciting. It's always fun to share and hear how real Montessori parents are making Montessori come to life in their home. And uh, today we have a really cool one. We're spotlighting Gina. Yep. So Gina is a mom of one who lives in Nairobi, Kenya. She's an alum of our Mont of our homeschool, the Redwoods primary program, which she tells us that she would definitely recommend. So thank you so much, Gina. She's originally from India, and she currently lives with her husband and her two-year-old at the time of this interview um, in Kenya. She's a peace and social development professional by day, and at night she transforms into a Montessorian and a content creator. <laughs> Too bad. I know. So many, many of us <laughs> are in the similar positions. That's right. She loves reading books to her daughter. She loves playing board games. Um, they work on puzzles together, something they do a lot. They cook a whole lot in the kitchen and they just kind of hang out together. And um, so she puts this beautiful life together. And I'm always really curious when we interview a member, uh, kind of figuring out where they mm -hmm. started from, yeah. like how they... Why Montessori? Why Montessori? How did yeah. they come upon Montessori? Um, and what's about it that really spoke to you? So when I asked Gina, she said, I'm going to quote, she said, when my daughter was born, I realized they didn't quite have the tools and resources to be able to navigate the complex world of parenting. So she said, I started reading and researching and I eventually found Montessori. She said the philosophy and approach aligned so much with our way of thinking and of living, how we were already mm -hmm. parenting, how we wanted to raise our child. She said, I began a journey of self-reflection and learning as I explored other parenting and educational approaches as well. She says that all of that led her to become a more conscious, respectful, and peaceful parent. She said she was able to heal from her own childhood as well. You know, many of us have work to do in that area, I mean, as well sure. as better understand, prepare for, and respond to her child's needs, right? So, um, yes, yeah, so beautiful. Yeah, I just love that so much. Um, several of the things kind of spoke to me in that, just that little section that yeah. she was talking about. Uh, first one was about, um, she mentioned that she knew that she wanted to learn more and that she was going to take on this path with, with seriousness, and something that we don't often think about entering a life of parenting, we kind of enter. And I think most of us kind of assume that it'll just come to us that, you know, it's something we're supposed to know how to do. Right. And we might feel embarrassed when we actually have to go and find a book about, you know, how to raise children or how, you know, what to do in the mm -hmm. tantrum, mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things. But she actually approached it from more of an academic point of view. Like, this is a skill, like I'm entering into a new profession and I'm going to I'm going to start researching and, and learning about it and taking it to heart. That's right. Um, so I think that that's something that a lot of parents can take away from just like that. There, there's no shame in having to learn how to become a better parent because that's it's right. not necessarily <clears throat> something that is specifically taught to any of us before we become parents. That's right. So we have this opportunity to like do the research and do the work and uh, take on the learning journey while we're actually parenting our own children. That's right. Which makes it kind of unique too, right? It's almost like we skip uh, the preparation part and we jump right into the internship <laughs> <laughs> or the lab work. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Learn by doing. Yeah, yeah. It's a real attention to mindfulness as we'll kind of see in the other parts of her 
uh, what she shares with us, it's a big part in, in why we thought this would speak so well to the idea of tools. I mean, the idea of self-reflection and learning and kind of taking that journey, uh, looking inward. You know, our slogan is it's a journey you take with your children. And, and so, you know, we, of course, believe that. I mean, it's part and parcel of the Montessori method. Uh, it's not about the teacher stage on the stage, as the old saying goes, uh, give, you know, giving out the information. It's about creating an environment that is open and inviting to children and or learners of whatever age that can you know interact with it. And then you as the guide are interacting with them, monitoring, sort of noting, making adjustments. But it's as much about your learning as anything else, just like I think very much like how Maria Montessori approached the work as a scientist mm -hmm. doing observation and careful study and thinking throughout. And right. I think that became the model that all of the teachers and facilitators and guys that she trained and that have then been trained. And for those of us who are drawn to the Montessori approach, I think that's part, part what speaks to it. For sure. So sure. we do, I do love uh, hearing how different people incorporate that Montessori mindset into their daily life. Uh, so she tells us a little bit more. She says she starts her day early about 6 a.m. I suppose it's early for some. It's early for me. I, I'm, not a, <laughs> I'm in a position where I don't have to get up at 6 a.m. anymore, and so I don't. Uh, but, uh, but she starts it with exercise. She does strength training three days a week. She does uh, aerobic, you know, short walking or something. The other two, and then she transitions uh, into time with her daughter. They have breakfast, they read, they play. About nine o'clock, she starts to work. Uh, they, she works from home uh, and she has a, a support. She has a caregiver who provides support while they are, while she's working. Uh, the child is out, the little one's out, you know, playing outside or, or doing other things. The uh, Gina will come back, they'll have lunch together, go back, do some more work. And then in the evening, uh, it's kind of, it sounds like it's dad time, which is cool. Uh, dad and daughter take over, they make dinner, maybe dad puts the little one to bed. And then after that, it's adult time, right? They shower, eating dinner, watching Netflix. She says, I end the day with a good book, or if I'm taking a course, I work on it. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting, right? Uh, you know, she, it's, she's living in Nairobi. That's so radically different in so many, you know, on the surface from us here in, you know, in San Francisco, California. Uh, but, you know, you hear in her journey and her, her rhythm, so many familiar notes, you know, busy working parents, balancing work life and home life and trying to kind of navigate through the, all of that. It's such a familiar story. I find it really heartwarming in a way yeah. because, you know, it, what it really shows is that no matter how many differences it seems like we might have on the surface that when you get down to the journey, the parenting journey, they're actually very common. There's a lot of commonalities. Yes. It's one of the reasons that the Montessori method works so well. For everyone. Yeah. That's right. Well, that's right. It's not And everywhere in the world. Exactly. And why why we do this work? Because we want to keep bring that access to folks because it, it really can't work everywhere. So, and that's what I, what I really particularly love about this is what we talked about earlier, though, is that she's really... Uh, carving out time for self-care. She's really showing a willingness to make exercise a part of her life. She reads and studies at night. Mm -hmm. She has personal time with her husband or in herself. You know, these are really, really important parts of a well-balanced life. And they're not only important for you and your mental and emotional well-being, they're super important as models. If you want your children to have a robust, rich, full life that includes a variety of things, like being a great parent and being really invested in learning, but also enjoying your work and also enjoying your, you know, your free time and, and enjoying exercise or whatever those things might be that are important to you. If you want that to happen, you have to model it mm -hmm. because the children are going to mimic it right out of the mouths of babes. So uh, if we want children to live a balanced life, we have to show them what that looks like. If they only see us ever working and being harried and like yeah. rushing around here and here and here, we get, they get the idea that that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's a real recipe for burnout and not necessarily the way that, you know, I think humans evolved to, to want to live. So if we want kids to grow up to be people who take care of themselves, we, we need to show them how. And I, that's what I liked in her write-up and her description is that yeah, she's really kind of trying to balance it out. She's she's kind of trying to figure out what tools she needs to make the balance. So, yes. Yeah, so I'd also like to say that um, 
it's easy for us to hear somebody else's journey and just assume that they've got it together all of the time. Exactly. And I think if Gina were here with us live, I think she would probably jump in and say like, I can't do everything all the time. And, and we would probably respond with, of course, nobody, nobody can do everything That's right. all of the time. Right. I so, assume that, you know, we ask but, them to kind of depict what the, their day is or average days. And I'm sure this, this is sort of a happy path sure, version, right? Sure. But um, I was thinking back to how we perceive our curriculum. You know, we talk about the the primary and the lower elementary mm -hmm. curriculum. Yeah. Um, I think you described it in a recent live as being almost like a like a plate that you pick Absolutely. from. That's right. You know, like uh, your nutrition. And uh, I think that she is a great example of using that approach for personal development yeah, to, to right. become a better parent as well. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about some tools David and I talked about um, when we were contemplating this subject for you. <laughs> oh, what kind of tools do we use? Right. <laughs> what do we what do we recommend? Like what Absolutely. really helps? Um, but just hearing about all the stuff she does, um, yeah, like you really have to nurture yourself. You have to do the research. You have to do a lot and you have to do the work. Um, and a lot of us also have lots of responsibilities. Um, and I think it's important to know that like sometimes uh, it's just like a little bit of self-care can sustain you mm -hmm. for a lot longer than you might think. Totally. Or, you know, so maybe like you're thinking, I'm just not doing enough, I'm not doing enough. But like if you're if you're kind of taking in, like if you look at your whole year, you kind of stretch it out, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh one part of your life, like you you really lean in and you're just like working, 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 working. Mm -hmm. You're not doing as much self-care, but then you recognize that and then you start taking in more mm -hmm. self-care and you kind of binge in on that a little bit mm -hmm. um, and get yourself back into a rhythm. Like if you kind of look over the the whole year um, at these tools, these pieces that kind of come together yeah, to make right. a parenting approach, most of us are doing better, I think, than we initially think that we are. Yeah, we or, can get easy to get hung up on the snacks. We're trying to do so too much at one yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. So old, I tried, you know, or not recognizing that you're trying to do too much and just mm -hmm. focusing in on the flaws. I think it's it can be so easy for us to become obsessed uh, or to measure our life by our mistakes yep. rather than in a more whole way. And uh, um, so having that sort of a variety of tools will help you to sort of have that bigger picture that can right. be really important. Right. So let's yeah. talk about tools. All right. So, yes. Yeah, so um, obviously she has a diverse array of tools. Um, we've also used a diverse array of tools ourselves in our own parenting. Um, so let's talk about gathering these right tools. Um, so the first thing that really came to mind for me, and I don't know if it comes to mind as much for you. You can talk about your own feels yeah. on this one. Um, but I feel like a very important part of my own parenting journey has been finding parenting mentors yeah. along the way and um, kind of surround, trying to surround myself with, of course, you know, there are parent, I, I'm friends with all kinds of people who mm -hmm. have a variety of parenting methods. But in particular, I tried, when my children were little especially, to really try and surround myself in particular with parents who are modeling the kind of parenting approach that I wanted to emulate. Yeah. And I found that when I was around those particular people, I would, I would, I would really pick them out and think, you know what? I really enjoy spending time with this person, but also I love the way she talks to her son, mm -hmm. or you know, and so I would schedule a play date so we could hang out with them. And then I would find myself using some of their phrases, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or in a moment of frustration, when I felt like I was really losing it, I would think, what would, you know, oh, yeah, what was it that my friend said the other day? Yeah. And I would try out that new phrase or that, you know, just kind of give me a different perspective. Um, and that was really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I also looked for parenting members, parenting mentors, who were just a little bit ahead, uh -huh. you know, so like peers who are like teaching their own children at the same ages as mm -hmm. mine, like that was really helpful. What are current people doing? But also like, what does one step ahead look like? Right. So if I could find a parent that was like, if I had a three-year-old and they had a four and a half year old or a five-year-old, or maybe they had multiple kids. So they like had a kid in primary and a kid in lower elementary. I could be looking ahead thinking, aha, mm -hmm. interesting. That's what this person is doing with their older child. And I could kind of, kind of envision myself getting there, you know, or being yeah. in that position. And I think having that, um, that, 
perspective of yeah. like that kind of future thinking, like, aha, I am a parent of a three-year-old, but I'm going, I am learning to be a parent of a six-year-old. That's right. I think that that really helped me personally. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Did you have any experience? Like, what, It wasn't what the same for me. Yeah, or? not really. I mean, I... <clears throat> you, were, I, you were also working full-time when we were teaching our little ones, but... That's right. I mean, I've, I definitely believe firmly in, in mentors and, and guides. I've had many really important mentors in my life, but in terms of my parenting journey, I actually, honestly, I feel that our... Um, this is, would be a separate point on here. There would be working with your partner. Uh, mm-hmm. So not necessarily a mentor outside the home, but our work working together in a relationship that's not quite like a mentorship, but learning from one another. And so that actually would be one of my bullet points is uh, work with your partner, like you have a game plan together, debrief, talk about what worked or what's not working. You know, it, it doesn't, not only when you have problems, although that that is inevitable and it is an important time, but also like successes, like, oh, I think that went really well, or I'm really excited to see this happen. Uh, and having that sort of emotional support in the home or, or whatever is, um, really, really vital. So not necessarily parenting mentors, um, but uh, definitely com- so needing like community and friendship. I mean, talking to my mother from, I remember when the boys were little, uh, I, you know, talking to my mother or your mother or mother-in-law for guidance on, on little one's care. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think, I think that goes in with mentorship. Yeah, for sure. Consider, yeah, yeah. Parents, grandparents, older, older folks in your life who, who provide wisdom. Absolutely. Yep. So I would say that, you know, and I think in a way as a, it's a great question, I guess, I don't think I seek it out in the same way that you do, but I definitely know that, you know, you were mentioning older. Your and I, environment also was very different. Yeah, you know, that's I right. Was, mostly I was taking the kids to the park a lot yeah. and I was making the play dates and yeah. you were in the office all day and I was. there aren't any children in there. No, so. but there are parents. And so yeah. sometimes, you know, that it can be one of the things you bond with colleagues over Mm -hmm. and talk about, but uh, yeah, it's just different, but for sure, there's no doubt that the human connection, whether it's an older, wiser family member or a sibling, if they, Mm -hmm. you know, we're the oldest, so we have the oldest kids, but, you know, I can imagine if you had siblings and looking up to them uh, and asking for their guidance, or if you are, uh, you know, just working together with your partner. So finding that human's re- resource, mm-hmm. that, that mm-hmm. connection. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the next thing that she, she mentioned, obviously Gina mentioned in hers, was uh, being really dedicated to that research and learning. Yeah. Um, so just to kind of con- kind of expand on that, there are many, many ways that you can develop, you know, that you can use this kind of tool that, and that we have used during our parenting journey mm-hmm. over the last 15 years, yep. um, you can, you know, and something we've done is just to continually be learning about our child's stages of development. We're still doing it. Yeah, You've yeah. got a 12 year old and a 15 year old, and we're still learning more and more about totally. what it's like to go through puberty, even though we remember <laughs> what it was like for ourselves to go through puberty, like learning again, like what exactly <laughs> happens and why, why do their brains do this and how, well, you know, you just can't relive I learned, it. So. I learned that, that kids, <laughs> at least Boys during puberty grow three inches per year, and that oh my blew gosh. my mind. <laughs> we came out. Of, we always go to. We, we went, just went to Costco yesterday, mm-hmm. and you know everybody's coming out of the Costco with their big purchases, but ours is overflowing. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, what's going on? But you know, you feed two on? teenage boys. Yeah. They eat like I remember a horse. people talking about it when we had littles. When I would meet people with teenagers, they would be like, Oh, oh they my teenagers, they're so expensive, like for yes. food, <laughs> right? They eat so much, and you see all that food, you're like, There's and no was, way, but then it'll be yeah. gone, they'll, they'll yeah. snarf it up. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, you the things that you, you know, yes, I, I was a teenage boy, I ate like a you know, <laughs> ate like a madman, uh, but. It was a different perspective. It was just sort of like the process of eating now, where as the parent, you're watching and trying to think about it. And like, how do you keep the house stocked with good food? And how do you guide them through that process? Yeah. It's very yeah. different. And yeah. um, and emotionally as well, totally. because, you know, they're, 
they're they're eating twice as much they're growing so much they've got growing pains like all this stuff you go back and you do more research on yeah. um but also emotionally as well you That's have to right. keep supporting your child emotionally and this work really began when they were babies we were trying to learn about uh, I remember learning, reading all these articles about um, the different types of cries that babies make, you know, and, and I thought at one point it was like, do I need to, to like <laughs> learn all of these different types of cries right. so that I know how to meet my baby's needs? You remember when I read that in the yes. book? I was like, should we be learning these yeah. types of cries? Um, and no, like <laughs> uh, it. I, I think anyone who has had a newborn and really bonded with them emotionally, like you, you get to know your own baby's cries and it, you know, it's, it's not, you That's don't need right. so much research, but like the process of going through it, of actually being interested in learning about that development, um, which is another reason that I wrote the baby's first year milestones, That's right. got to relive those that first year of development <laughs> through that book. Um, toddler discipline there's, for there's, every there's, age and stage. Mm -hmm. same. Yep, toddlers yeah. too. So, but there's lots of, of places where you can go, both books and on the internet, you know, you type in, uh, you know, how, how developmental characteristics of a three-year-old and you're going to get a bunch of websites that give you some you know they they might not give you a clear path of exactly what to do but they give you they give you some paths to explore well right? actually it's better if you find somebody who gives you a really concrete specific path i would look a little bit skeptically at that mm -hmm. because children are not widgets they yep. don't have a specific process that's why traditional educational environments often are kind of aimed right at the middle, because if you were to actually try and educate in the way that every unique child needs to be educated, it would cost more money than we're willing to spend on resources and people and teachers and things like that. Thus, you might consider homeschooling, for example, because then you can provide that. Um, because the reality is there are great uh, guides. Montessori herself did all that great research, and we know the planes of development, and we know what lessons are going to be right, and we know the subject areas, and we know all the sensitive periods. But it, again, it's not like first this happens, and then this happens, and this. You're not making a peanut butter sandwich. It is a human being. And the bad news is uh, there it's not going to be step by step, and that can be scary. The good news is there is lots of work out there. And if you read it and kind of rock it to kind of incorporate it all in your mind, what you're going to realize is the general, there are some general rules, some general yep. guidelines. So being dedicated to learning, reading yeah, about it, yeah, having so an books, open mind, internet workshops, and not getting hung up on courses. specific things, but yeah. instead having a mindset of a, a particular approach or a mindset that that'll serve you really well. In fact, I think that would be, uh, that's my next one uh, that I'd point out is, is adopt a philosophy of learning and parenting uh, because it isn't like a one, two, three step uh, process, even though you know, there's lots of books out there and things like that, that will um, try and provide that to you. Again, I would say be very skeptical about plug and play type systems. They just really cannot deliver what they're promising by and large because the human animal is just too weird. We just don't fit into boxes well. And so the better approach is to have a philosophy of education like mm -hmm. Montessori and then read and learn and explore around that and kind of get the big structure so that you have this framework that you can move through the child's life with. Right. So, you know, learning about the planes of development, learning about things like the grace and courtesy lessons, learning about uh, practical life lessons for your little one. Uh, these are all, these would be part of a Montessori philosophy. They're not again, like ABC. It's a mindset. There are specific lessons you can give, but you're looking more philosophically and that would then match to that period of research. So when you give your child a Montessori lesson, and you mentioned grace and courtesy. Yep. So for those of you who don't know what that is, a grace and courtesy lesson is within the practical life yep. um, subject area. And it basically means that we are teaching our children specifically the, the little things that they need for appropriate and um, kind, polite Washing behavior. Washing your hands, blowing your nose. So opening... Same opening a door for somebody or um, how to not disturb mommy while she's working right. <laughs> or doing, doing something, right? How to behave in a grocery store. Like these sorts of little lessons, um, they teach your child how to behave out and about in the world. And that is, that is 
If you adopt this philosophy of education and you say it's going to be Montessori, you're going to learn that philosophy of education by giving the lessons to your child. So yes. I guess that's what I'm trying to say I is see. that like, um, yes, it's important to understand the Montessori method, but you won't actually understand it in full until you start practicing. It. Well, this goes to what Gina said earlier, like mm -hmm. this idea of the, like the self-discovery, right? Or it's the journey you take with your children. So it, uh, that is a great caveat. If you set out to say, I'm going to learn everything about it before I do it, that's also not going to work, right? In the same way that you're, you're not going to be able to master a one, two, three, four, five step, you're not going to be able to learn everything. Learn, kind of become enough aware that this is aligned. And Montessori again is is something we think very feel very strongly works for everybody. Um, and then go into it and start working through the material. And like you said, as you're giving those grace and courtesy lessons, the philosophy is going to start to come through, and that will then kind of guide your work going forward right. as you research more or you learn right. more things. And not just, not just grace and courtesy. It could be any lesson. Anytime you give a lesson to your child, you are in the Montessori approach. You're observing your child. You're totally. learning more about them. That's right. Um, and it's just going to get better and better and better. That's right. Um, it's so, inherent to the Montessori curriculum. Is that yeah. cosmic education. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing that I, she mentioned that we, uh, that Gina mentioned that is also uh, pretty significant for us is make time for yourself in terms of self-care and personal hobbies. I right. know it's very, it can be very, very hard, especially when you have very little ones. Uh, but even if you just have a very short window of time that you set aside before bed, or if you can carve out time to go to the gym, go for a walk around the block, do puzzles, crosswords, if you commute on the bus or the train I used to, when I worked in the office, I would commute by train. I would do puzzles and things in the morning. And uh, instead of answering work emails or other things, because it was like a personal time. And it was very, very important to kind of clearing the mind, meditation or prayer, uh, rituals, anything like that, following a sports team, baseball season's coming back up. And that's why I'm excited to see how the, <laughs> maybe the Giants will have a better season, hopefully, God willing, uh, in the, the year ahead. So like that, following a team, watching the scores, it doesn't matter. It could be watching TV, watching Netflix and chill. As long as you um, have something that is yours and you feel like some uh, some connection with, that's what matters. Uh, it's a time for yourself where you can feel yourself again and not that you're just constantly giving 100% of you to your husband or wife and your kids and your job and everything else. That's a recipe for burnout and it won't make you a very happy or effective parent or person. It's true. We... We do have a slightly different perspective on this. Um, you know, when I I remember being a parent uh, of our very, very young children, say when we had like a three-year-old mm -hmm. and a newborn, and with the exception of the weekends, uh, Monday through Friday, because you were, mm -hmm. you were present on the weekends, that was such a blessing. Um, but Monday through Friday, finding time for, for self-care was super, super hard for me. It was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. David was getting home super late, you know, sometimes after dinner time, even after the kids have been put to bed. Yeah. Uh, he had this crazy schedule during that period in our life. Um, and we co-slept with our kids and I woke up with them. So there was no like, uh, Aubrey, do you want to get up at four o'clock in the morning to have some self-care time before the kids wake up? No, well, I, I need, I need as much sleep as I can. So there was a period of time when right. our children were little where right. I did feel that pressure like that, um, the pressure that I, I was sensing was like, if I don't get self-care into this equation, if I don't take care of myself, I know I'm not going to be the parent that I want to be for my children. That's but right. finding the time, like finding that classic outside time, like, oh, just go to the gym or go for a run or, you know, just uh, spend some time journaling by yourself in the morning or, you know, spend time in the evening. That wasn't part of what was possible within my life. And so what I found was that um, instead of like carving out time for only only me where no mm -hmm. one else, you know, no one else was there about me, um, I found that I was able to incorporate a lot of self-care into my life with the children mm -hmm. while they were there. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was setting boundaries, you know, simply tell the children, I'm going to read my book right now uh, while you guys play. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and they would come up, mommy, do this. Mommy, look at this. Mommy, um, come play with me. Come, you know, you be the, the baby and I'm going to do this 
person, I would say, oh, you know, it's still time. It's still my reading time, you know, and I'll be with you as soon as I'm finished with this chapter. Yeah. So setting some boundaries for that so that you are able to um, show your child that you are taking care of yourself and you are investing in your own well-being uh, is a healthy boundary to set with your children. And it's very possible. With exercise, you know, I found that um, because going away to a, a yoga class or a gym, mm -hmm. you know, during that particular period of our lives, and it didn't last forever, you know, obviously. That's right. Um, but it wasn't possible on Monday through Friday during those days, you know, that I was in the primary caregiver. Um, I found ways that I could exercise while the children were in the room. I danced in the kitchen. We had big dance parties together. I would bring my weights to the playground and I would do my weights, you know, mm -hmm. while the kids were playing. Uh, and maybe I looked a little silly out there as the only one with weights, but uh you know, it, it was a way that I could show myself. You do what you have to care. do. Yeah. So, and, and there know. are periods of time where it's just, you're not going to be able to squeeze it in. I mean, you're, what you're saying right. is absolutely right. Like yeah. it's, uh, it's so important. And yet we, off, especially at various periods of our time as parents, it can just be like a non-starter. Yeah. But I want to, what I want to underscore that you never lost sight of is that how important it is. Right. So even if there were periods of time where you couldn't engage, you knew you were hurting yourself. Right. And then it became something that you and I worked through a lot to try and figure it out. So yep. bedtime, I started taking over bedtime routines right. entirely so that you could have time to yourself or doing other things. Um, it just certainly, that's, I was thinking about the way Gina said that it seems like they sort of structure, she did, handles morning and the husband handles yes. the evening. And it's a way to kind of balance it out. Again, it's not always possible. Unfortunately, uh, we don't live in a world where the family is, the center of our world. <laughs> so until that <laughs> glorious moment, then uh, we all are sort of pulled in a million different directions. Some of many of which are not about the family and the home and the balance of the, our family life, but uh, life hopefully is long and there's ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And if you have the mindset, uh, have it. And as it becomes more available to you, don't feel like you have to continue to fill your cup with mommy and daddy duties. It's okay to save some room in yourself to paint, to, mm -hmm exercise. Yep, even and, if your children are there, you know, and especially, maybe even especially. If that's right. There. So when our kids got a, old enough, we started hiking a lot. That was an activity we could do. We could carry the kids uh, on pouches or in, uh, they, you know, over time they became stronger and stronger. So short walk, hikes at first, longer and longer over time. And it became a family activity that was a, a very much a personal hobby as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, you're walking in the woods, you're communing with nature, whatever you, however that experience is for you. And uh, it created a habit also for the kids, like this is something you should put into your life as well. So as your children get older, you can incorporate them into the hobby in a way that does not necessarily diminish its value or specialness to you. So um, Gina also recommends focusing on your inner transformation. And she says, and I thought this was so sweet. She says, quote, because your child is perfect the way they are. <laughs> Isn't that That's true? Right. Yeah. It's up to us to work on our own development and to show them how it's done. Um, and right. the, the child that they are right now, you know, it's, um, I think we often come at parenting issues, expecting our children to change. You know, how do I get my child child to do this or to behave like this? Um, children, children are just born, these beautiful little beings, and they are who they are at that moment. They, in most cases, they're doing the best that they can already. Um, and so it's up to us to work on how to educate ourselves so that we can be, mm -hmm. the, be the best parents that we can be for them. Totally. And, uh, you know, it, it comes to mind is that you a guy once said, it's not what goes in the mouth, it's what comes out. Uh, if you want your child to have good behaviors, don't just say that you believe in them. They're going to copy what you do. So if you want your child to incorporate healthful practices, you want them to love your family cooking time together, you want them to have an interest in music or whatever your passions and hobbies are, it's whatever you're actually engaging with. If you tell them over and over and over, but never listen to music or never cook food, they're not going to get it. You have to engage with it. And that's one of the reasons why it's actually very selfless to practice self-care, which I guess think leads us to our last tip as we're about to wrap up, which is be kind to yourself. 
You're only human. You're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Sometimes gigantic mistakes, but it's okay. Kids are super resilient. Don't get hung up on the little things. Gina, as Gina tells us, she says, I'm doing the best I can do with what is available to me at the moment. I am proud at how far I've come. I can do this. Yes. <laughs> that's a good affirmation. I love that mentality. I do. All right. That's that's where we're going to stop today. I hope that you got a, a few little takeaways from Gina's journey. Um, thank you so much for joining, friends. If you have any questions for us or any feedback, you can always email us at hello at childoftheredwoods.com. You'll reach both me and David there. That's right. And if you like the show, and we hope you do, please leave a comment or a thumbs up or send us an email if you want to share other thoughts. We love hearing them. If you like this as an audio, we, it is available as a podcast, so you can go check that out also on our website, childoftheredwoods.com. And otherwise, we'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs> see you at one o'clock next week. All right. Take care, friends. Bye.